Uh, the nature of this video is uh, I'm going to do my version of an introduction to uh, float fishing. Uh, it's just going to be maybe a checklist of things that you're going to want to know before you hit the river. I'm not going to go into great detail on everything, but hopefully I'll touch on enough subjects that you'll know whether or not there's things you're going to need to look into further uh, before you hit the water. But uh, the majority of this information is going to be based on my experience. My experience uh, is going to be Great Lakes fishing mostly and it's also going to be Raven products. Um, this information is going to be transferable whether you get a different center pin from a different company, uh, a different rod. Um, a lot of this information will apply on the west coast as well but when it gets down to the rigging and that it's kind of more so uh, Great Lakes centered. Uh, I'm going to try to do a uh, kind of a breakdown for you before I get started. I'll go into the pros and cons of going uh, new and used and uh, what you might encounter. I'll quickly go over the different approaches that you can use on the water um, and they don't always have to be exclusive of, of each other. Um, you know, it's, it's beneficial to, to have more options at your disposal. Uh, I'll go over what you might want to consider when choosing a rod. Uh, I'll quickly go over some of the rigging uh, just so you'll know whether or not you're going to need to get some more advice from a friend or watch some more videos or talk to your, your local tackle shop. Uh, I'll quickly go over some of the different casts but there's lots of good videos out there on those. Uh, I'll go over some of the baits that are popular. Uh, you don't always have to use roll bags. There's there's a lot of options outside of roll bags. And some of the different uh, species that you can target with your center pin. Um, now, after the video is done, if you're searching for other information, uh, there's lots of groups on Facebook and that that you can kind of use to your advantage. Uh, Steelhead Manifesto, etc. Um, if you go to the Raven Tackle website, uh, a lot of this information is going to be there for you if you need to reference it further or the, on their YouTube channel they have uh, like a tips and techniques uh, playlist uh, that you can look into uh, if there's certain things that you need clarification on moving forward. Um, now, so back to the top, uh, do you want to get into center pin fishing or you're just getting into it? Um, either way, you might have some new product or you might want to buy something new, in which case, you know, you can get whatever you want. There's tons of options out there. Um, Kingpin, Islander, Rapala, um, Okuma, uh, there's lots of smaller guys out there now. Um, Colville's making reels, uh, Majestic reels, EBA, uh, there's a lot of different guys out there that are uh, making smaller batches um, and you might want to look into those as well uh, frog waters or um, there's a bunch of options out there um, now if you're going to go used um, the majority of my experience with equipment is obviously like I, like I said is the Raven products uh, if you do go and purchase uh, a used reel uh, it's there's a lot of things that you're gonna have to figure out if you're comfortable with if you're comfortable with having somebody ship you something if you have if you're comfortable having something shipped over the border um, if you're okay with e-transferring money to a stranger or doing pay PayPal and depending on them to come through uh, there's some used groups on Facebook to track down uh, Float fishing gear, uh, river rats, I think, is one of the more popular ones. But uh, you know, there's pros and cons to each. If you go, if you go new, obviously you're going to get your warranty card, and um, you know you'll get all the information and the specs on the box. Uh, most newer reels will come with a case. Uh, for Raven reels, the T4 and the T5 come with the case. The other reels don't. I'm not sure about 
uh, the other manufacturers, but Raven has a couple of different sizes of uh, cases for your reel. The smaller cases, they fit a little bit snug. Uh, the larger case that they have uh, is good. It makes it a little bit easier to have the case on and move from hole to hole or to finish up your day and keep all your rigging together. Uh, it, it's a little bit easier that way. Um, now if you're getting to used equipment, uh, you might run into issues of the reel needs new bearings or the clicker might be broken. Uh, but outside of that, there aren't a lot of things that go wrong with the center pin. Uh, so if you do go used and you decide to go Raven, um, the clicker design uh, stayed pretty consistent across, uh, across all the Raven models. Uh, some of the older ones have a different uh, different style button on the back to engage and disengage the clicker. Uh, the newer ones have a smaller little button, uh, but internally uh, the clicker design is pretty much the same. So if you need some parts uh, like a paw, the little triangle piece or a spring, then you can probably get that still from, from the service department at Raven. If you get into some of the newer reels from Raven, they're going to have slightly different clicker styles. The Helix has a knob uh, clicker. The T4 and the T5 have uh, more of a ratchet style clicker. Uh, these clickers uh, are really reliable and uh, aren't a lot of issues with these at all. Um, now for bearings, if you buy used uh, Raven, there's a few things to keep in mind when it comes to bearings. Um, when you get into the, the older reels, uh, the Vectra, the Classic, and the Eclipse, these models uh, that were made in Canada, I'm going to put up a list later with the manufacturing dates. and. Um, the names of each of the reels with a picture and then hopefully if you want to try to track down something that I talk about uh, keep your eyes open for it on eBay or whatever then you'll know the name of it but uh, the thing to keep in mind with these reels um, if you go to replace the bearings these are going to be like an imperial bearing um, the size of these bearings is going to be 0.625 by 0.19 Sorry, 0 0.25 by 0 0.625 by 0 0.196. Um, the majority of the information on the Boca Bearings website is correct if you search for a Raven reel and try to get your replacement bearings from Boca. Some of the information is not correct, so I'm going to try to help you through that. Uh, so the older reels, you got the Imperial bearings with those dimensions. But there are also different versions of some of the older reels. There's a, I believe, a newer version of the Eclipse and a newer version of the Classic that do not take that size bearing. They take the same size bearing as all the current models. Um, and I believe that dimension, you're going to have to check for yourself, is more of a metric size, uh, 7 millimeters by 14 millimeters by 5 millimeters. Okay. So that size bearing will go through the, the Vectra SST, all the matrixes, and the T3, the T2, the T4, and the T5. Uh, the only thing that, there's two exceptions to that. There's the old uh, three screw matrix, um, which has a uh, I believe a 6 by 13 by 5 millimeter bearing, but I'm pretty sure the information on Boca is correct for that. Um, and then outside of that is the Helix. This is a kind of the older version of the Helix, but the newer version is the same. The Helix is 6 by 15 by 5 uh, millimeters. Um, so if you're going to swap out the bearings, 
getting access to the bearings themselves is going to be different um, across a couple of these models. Uh, the Helix is pretty much the only one that you're going to access the bearings from the back if you want to swap them out. That seems to be the thing to do. But uh, it's there's a tool that Raven has to take these out. I've heard stories of guys using half inch chisels or a spoon etc to get access to these bearings but this is threaded and you can get access to the bearings uh, through the back here all the other models you access the bearings through the front and that this is just if you're gonna upgrade the bearings but uh, if you do end up loosening anything off when you're you know checking out how things are made if you're if you're mechanically inclined and like to take stuff apart before you use it to understand it better just be careful because a lot of the the screws are going to have Loctite potentially on them and anything you loosen off that has Loctite it might not stay snug when you get back on the water and you're using the equipment um, so just bear that in mind if you do end up breaking a clicker um, while you're on the water uh, it's a good idea to always have a uh, hair elastic tied to your rod, whether you use it to break your rods down or not. But the hair elastic tied to your handle uh, can quickly substitute uh, for a functioning clicker. Keep you in the game, and it's easy fix until you can get things looked after. The Matrix reels, they have a thumb screw. It's also a tension screw. If you over tighten it, it'll affect the performance of the, of the reel, it won't spin as freely and you can adjust that on the water depending on your preference and then you can get access to the bearings through the front here there's just three little three little screws to take out afterwards if you want to do anything with the bearings there and To get access to the vector bearings, uh, there's just a couple of screws in the face here along with the center screw that you'll have to remove. And this part, the cross member here with the handles on it will come off. The uh, other design, you're going to need like a six-sided um, like an allen key or a six-sided uh, drill bit or screw bit to loosen off the one screw underneath in here that releases the bearings and then obviously the three screws on the on the, the face plate there the center cap and then the other different option is the Vectra the whole center screw uh, this is threaded and then you'll need um, like a little socket to take out the nut in there to get access to the bearings for this reel. But uh, there's some different options for bearings if you're going to upgrade them. The, the T4 and the T5 come with ABEC 5 bearings. The majority of the other reels um, come with ABEC 3 bearings. It's all personal preference if you upgrade. If you upgrade you might have the option of going with a ceramic bearing instead. Um, there's pros and cons to everything. Uh, some have less maintenance, some are noisier. Um, again, it's all kind of personal preference. You know, lubricating your bearings versus not lubricating your bearings. Uh, that's a whole other point of discussion. Uh, some guys believe in one drop of oil and that's it to keep the grit from accumulating. Uh, I've I don't usually do any maintenance on my reels, but uh, again, that's all all personal preference. So that kind of goes through things you might encounter uh, going with uh, the used reels. Um, so I guess we can move on to the, the different techniques that you might also use on the water, like as a one-two punch if you're going to carry a backup rod with you on the river or leave one in your car in case you have an accident but uh, obviously there's a lot of fly fishermen out there the center pin you're going to get better longer drifts uh, 
the fly rod has its has its uses as well. It's a little more effective when you get into the shallow shallower water and certain sections of the rivers are fly fishing only. Now you can get into uh, bait casting as well, which is a lot more popular on the west coast. Uh, Raven has uh, bait casting rods that are spiral wrapped or acid wrapped, uh, depending on the terminology you want to use. Their rods are 11 foot 6 and uh, you know it's great to have that option if you're on the river uh, if you want a bottom bounce uh, or if you want to cast some hardware or spinners, spoons, etc. then it opens up a few options for you and you can float fish uh, quite effectively as well with uh, the bait casting reel. It's not as quick to set the hook as a center pin but Everything has its advantage and disadvantage. Uh, the spinning reel is something else that you can use. Uh, Raven has some spinning uh, rods as well. You can check out the website to check those out. Uh, they have beefier ones for salmon and uh, they have steelhead rods as well. And uh, the spinning reels, they don't perform as well for float fishing at distance as the center pin. Um, you get the coils in the line when it comes off and there's, there's a bunch of different issues with flipping over the bale to set the hook and that but uh, you know there's advantages and disadvantages and it's great to carry this as a second option for you know casting spinners or bottom bouncing but uh, you know there isn't one technique that's better than the other they're all just kind of tools uh, for the end game of uh, catching more fish. Okay, uh, the other uh, half of uh, center pin is uh, picking out a rod. Uh, one of the major decisions you're going to have to do uh, when you're picking out a rod is decide if you want to go with a fixed reel seat or a sliding rings handle. Uh, the fixed reel seat this is the only spot that you can place your reel so you're limited in that way but it's a little more aesthetic uh, it's a little more secure and it's easier to, to swap out reels if you want to change your reel at the end of the at the end of a trip so there are advantages to the fixed reel seat and uh, if you know where you like to have something and it's not available that way on a, you know a manufactured rod then you can go custom. There's a lot of guys out there that are doing custom rods. Uh, you know, local guys in Canada might include uh, you know G Bay, G Bay Rods, uh, G Bay Customs, which is uh, Glenn Goss. Uh, there's Danny Colville, Don Christmas. There's a lot of guys out there. Mags. There's a lot of guys that are doing uh, custom rods these days. But um, you know, you got to give yourself some time to to get the blank to them and. Uh, and then let them do their work. So if you need to get on the water in a hurry and you're going with a manufactured rod, uh, Raven has a lot of options um, for fixed reel seat uh, or sliding rings. The one thing with sliding rings is you can locate your reel anywhere you want along the rod, except you have to rely on the, the sliding rings to secure the reel to the handle. Some of the rods have metal rings There are rods that have uh, softer rings as well, but uh, if you are using the sliding rings, I like just to have a couple wraps of line underneath before I secure the, the reel to the rod, and it just helps snug everything up and protect the cork a little bit, but uh, that's personal preference. Uh, one thing I think I forgot to mention, uh, another consideration when you're picking out a rod uh, is how many pieces it's going to break down to. Uh, a two-piece rod is nice, breaks down nicely, it's easy to travel with, um, but it doesn't make the rod very short so it's going to be a little more awkward hiking through the bush and it might be a little more awkward to, 
to get it into your car safely. So a uh, two-piece rod, it's easier to break down, but it's going to end up breaking down a little bit longer, and that's got its own set of problems. So a three-piece rod breaks down nice and small, and it's easy to get in the car, but uh, it, it's a little more of a finicky mess when you get it broken down into the three pieces. So some guys like the four-piece rods where you have the option to break it down into a two-piece, but if you need for the rod to take up more space, you can break it down into four pieces. So um, Raven has two-piece rods and three-piece rods, um, but they don't have any four-piece rods. So uh, that is another consideration for you if you're uh, going to get a rod uh, for full fishing. So. Uh, when you're choosing a rod, um, it's uh, one of the things that's really going to impact the rod that you're going to choose is the river that you're going to fish. If the river for, river that you're going to fish, uh, you know, has limited access, there's overhanging branches, and it's a little small creek that's not very deep. You know, all those kind of factors are going to you know lend themselves to a shorter rod. Uh, you're fishing, you know, a wide open river with lots of space and deeper runs. Uh, you're gonna probably go with a 15 foot rod or longer, and then you know a, a river in between, a medium sized river. Then you're gonna go with a, a medium sized rod. Popular size for float fishing is, you know, somewhere around 13 feet. So if you, you know, you can fish smaller water or bigger water with it, but at the end of the day, a smaller river might be more suited to a smaller rod and a larger river might be more suited to a longer rod. Um, but, you know, there's all different actions of rods. You know, some with a slower action where, you know, they curve right through or faster action where, you know, there's less bend through the, the midsection. Like, there's so many things to consider. Raven has a good spectrum of rods that you can check out, but uh, if you if you're in a tackle shop and you're trying out a rod, and if there's anything you don't like about that rod when you're in the tackle shop, but you know at the end of an eight-hour day, that's going to bother you a lot. You know if the tip is too noodly or if the rod is too heavy at the end of an eight-hour day on the river, those things are really going to annoy you and take away from. Um, your enjoyment of fishing on the on the river so you know put a little bit of thought into the rod and the reel together and uh, you know it'll serve you well um, as you spend more time on the water now you've got your rod picked out you've got your reel picked out you're gonna need to get uh, some line on your reel uh, some makes some makes or reels, you don't need to have backing. Other makes you do. Um, the box that your reel comes with, it might give you some guidance as to how much backing to put on. Um, you know, Dacron backing or fly backing is a really good option. It comes in a lot of different colors now if you're trying to accent, you know, a custom rod or if you want to just be a little more flashy. Um, you know, the Dacron comes in different weight ratings and the heavier weight ratings are probably going to take up a lot more space on your spool so these are just things to, to consider before you decide to put backing on your reel uh, the easiest way to put the backing on for me uh, I just do like an overhand knot and then feed the backing through on itself uh, then you get it on your reel backing will cinch down and stay tight when you're reeling in um, but if it doesn't you just flip the loop over the other way and then the backing will cinch down and you can fill up as much backing as you need. You got to leave your space for your main line. Um, 
but that's how you start out. The backing helps out with the color and helps keep everything nice and neat and dry and clean. Um, so after you get the backing on your reel, uh, you're going to need to pick out a main line. There's a ton of different main lines out there. Everybody's got their opinion. Uh, I use a lot of uh, Raven main line. The majority, the majority of the time, I'm fishing the high vis line. Um, it just, you know, if you're sharing the river with somebody you know or you don't know, doesn't matter. It helps them track where your float is so they don't cross your line. And uh, it's nice to. Uh, you can see how much line you have out and how it's behaving on the surface to decide if you need to, to tighten up or mend your line a little bit. And those are the reasons I like the high vis. Uh, the flip side of the coin is a lot of people think it spooks the fish, in which case Raven has uh, some clear line, some smoke line, and like a moss kind of color. So uh, you can go with the lower visibility line. I tend to use those colors for my shot line when I'm running a slip float and fishing a little bit deeper but uh, you know personal preference you'll have to choose between a high vis line and a lower vis line at the end of the day one of the major considerations is you're going to want to step down the line rating from your main line to your shot line to your tippet material or if you're not having a shot line then you're going to have to step down from your main line to your tippet if you're or your leader material if you're fishing shallower so for me I fish 12 pound main line majority of the time I'll do a 10 pound shot line and then an 8 pound leader um, if you don't have a, a shot line in between just make sure you're stepping down from the line rating from your main line to your leader material that way if you do have a break off you're not losing you know everything from your float all the way down you're just gonna you know lose the point of least resistance so the point of least resistance will be hopefully if nothing's damaged up above you might just lose your leader and you just have to put another section of leader on and a new hook so that's the rationale between stepping things down and you're going to want to make sure you're running a leader material that's you know uh, in line with the line reading for your rod, you know, if your rod's only rated for 8 to 10 pound uh, line, then make sure your tippet uh, doesn't exceed uh, 10 pounds, uh, just to protect, just to protect your rod from breaking. Uh, so once you've got the backing on and the line on, now we can get into the rigging a little bit. If you buy if you buy floats from Raven, um, you go to the website and they'll have a, a chart on there that'll help you pick which floats most appropriate uh, for the, the depth and the, the speed of the river that you're fishing. Um, each of the floats is going to have a, a gram rating on it and they're all going to have a line on here that will indicate where they're uh, fishing most effectively and being most sensitive. Um, so the gram rating on the float is going to indicate how much shot each of the, the floats needs uh, to get to that point. And there's a chart there as well that I can insert here that'll break down how much uh, each of the different size shots weighs and then you can work backwards to figure out how much you need to add to your line. Uh, but you have to keep in mind the bait that you're using might impact the amount of weight that the, the float will carry. So if you're running like a big jig head on there, it's gonna take away from how much weight you're gonna need to add to the line to get the, the float to work effectively. If you don't have enough weight uh, on your line, then the float might sit on the water and uh, not be very sensitive. And if you overshot it, then you might not be able to see what your float is doing. Uh, so there's an optimal amount of shot which is covered by the, the, the line or the gram rating of the float. But if you use a fixed float, 
you're going to need to pick up some silicone tubing. Uh, it comes in two different sizes, uh, 1 16th and 3 30 seconds, I believe. There's a larger size for the top of the float. The, the top of the float's a little bit larger. And uh, you secure that to the line. The silicone is right on the line. You secure the top and the bottom of the float. And it allows you to do little adjustments to the depth you're fishing just by sliding the float one way or the other. And if the float ends up being too big, uh, or if you're fishing a different section of the river and you need to flip into a different float, then you're able to do so just by unattaching the float from the silicone. But uh, once you got your float picked out and you have the right amount of weight, um, you're going to step it down most likely to a little barrel swivel to your uh, either your shot line or or your leader material and then if you're running a shot line then from your shot line you might have another inline barrel swivel step down to your leader and then down to your hook uh, depending on what you're running um, the difference for uh, slip float uh, the slip float itself is right on the line so you're going to need a different system to, to stop it uh, so there are some float stops uh, that you can buy and uh, float stops I like to have one above the float and one below the float the one above the float sets the depth that you're going to be fishing at the one below the float I like to place above the first weight that you're going to use uh, whether it's uh, you know an inline egg sinker when you're salmon fishing or some sort of little BB shot if you're trout fishing I like to have that bobber stop below the float it keeps the float from crashing into your weight and uh, damaging the float and uh, it also it might save your float if you have a break off when you're salmon fishing like your egg, your egg sinker gets stuck and, and you break off at that point then the, the little bobber stop above there uh, could save uh, could save your float from uh, going down the river and uh, costing you a couple bucks but uh, there's all kinds of different shotting patterns and they're all affected by you know the speed of the water and, and how deep you're fishing um, you know I can insert some pictures here of some of the different patterns but they can all be found on the, on the Raven website and everybody seems to have their version their own little version of the shotting patterns that they prefer and and you can find that uh, all over the place uh, if you need some clarification on some of the ideas behind the different shot patterns uh, so you've got your rod your reel you're all rigged up now you're to the point where you're going to need to to cast the easiest cast, nobody really uses it, but if you're stuck, um, you can do like a loop cast, single loop or a double loop. You get a bunch, bunch of line here and then you can cast that all out and let go. And then all this line is how far your, your presentation can go. So, 3, 6, 12, 18, I can do like an 18 foot cast just grabbing a couple loops of line. Um, the next kind of easiest cast is a side cast. If you hold the line off to the side of the reel, it just like, it almost falls off the spool. And the side cast is uh, very similar to how a spinning reel works. The line flies off the front of the spool through the first guide. So essentially if you're doing a side cast, you're almost making the, the side of the center pin like the front of a spinning reel. So in order to do the cast, when you go to throw your, your rig out to the river, you have to hold your hand 
off the side of the spool here, perpendicular, and then all the line when you do your cast will fly off the side of the spool. Um, the disadvantage of that cast is it puts a lot of twist into the line and during the course of the day that will build up and cause you some grief. Um, if this is the only cast that you can learn, sometimes guys will put a little uh, micro swivel above their float to help cancel out some of that twist, but I don't like doing that and I don't recommend it. If you reel that swivel into the tip of your, your rod enough times you might damage the ceramics or you might damage the guide. So uh, The side cast is a, is a good one. There's another version of the side cast where you get the you get the spool spinning a little bit. Obviously I do this all with the clicker off. Um, but the spinning side cast is great for distance and uh, it cuts down a little bit of the line twist that will build in by the line coming off the side of the spool. Uh, another cast is the Wallace cast and the Wallace cast is more similar to how the bait caster uh, performs. So the bait caster, the, the drum gets spinning at the same speed as the bait and everything else is flying off the rod, at which point, you know, just before you hit the water, you kind of have to stop your bait caster or you'll get like an overspool. Uh, the bait caster, the benefit is there's no line twist. And that's the major benefit to doing like the Wallace cast. The, the spool and the line behave a lot like they would if you're using a bait caster. So, you know, the end game is to cut down on line twist. And that's why a lot of guys swear by the Wallace cast. Um, there's another version of the Wallace cast, just like the BC swing. And uh, you basically, it's a lot like the Wallace cast, except instead of getting the spool spinning with your hand, you use the momentum and the weight of all the tackle that you're going to be casting out uh, to get the spool going, and then you'll have to stop it. Uh, when the presentation uh, or all your rigging hits the water. Now, the Wallace cast is okay if you have a couple of feet of line underneath the tip of your rod. If you only have, between your float and your presentation, if you're only managing four, five, six feet of line, then you can probably do a Wallace cast. Um, but if you're fishing a slip float and you have a lot more line underneath, underneath your float, um, then the, you don't really have enough room to do uh, the Wallace cast. Um, you might have to do this the spinning side cast, but there's a time and a place for everything. Uh, sometimes you'll sacrifice a little bit of line twist uh, for distance, and sometimes you'll sacrifice distance for, for less line twist. But uh, there's a ton of videos on casting. Um, you know, you can scroll through some of them. Uh, the way other people explain it might make more sense to you or they might present it visually different a different way and it'll make more sense to you but uh, those are the basic casts that are out there and um, you know a lot of the casts you're not actually facing the river and uh, but at the end of the day if you are flow fishing you're generally cro uh, you're generally casting directly across from you and then floating downstream. Very seldom are you casting upstream uh, because generally your presentation is sitting deeper than the actual run that you're fishing. So if you're casting upstream, chances are you're going to get a bad snag by the time your rig starts floating down downstream. Um, if, you know, the hard part, some of the hard part for people is to figure out how deep to fish. Basically, if you're getting a snag on the bottom every 10 casts or something, then you're probably in the proper range. If you're snagging up all the time, you're too deep, and if you're not snagging up, you might not be deep enough. Um, and then you can kind of read how your float presents. A lot of the time, you're going to want, as the float is going downstream, 
you're going to want it pointed back towards you and then you know that your presentation is kind of kicking up off the bottom and it's presenting first to the fish before all your end tackle like your micro swivels and your weights and everything if your float is pointing downstream when it's going chances are you're fishing too deep and everything is kind of dragging across the bottom so there's a lot that you can learn from your float you can learn if you have you know not enough weight too much weight you know you can learn if your presentation is going properly or if it's dragging and uh, so there's a lot of information that you can get from your float you know you're heading out to the river and uh, you know you know how to cast you got everything's all rigged up now you have to choose uh, the baits that you're going to use um, typically you know everyone's going to be throwing row bags um, you know you're not out of the game if you don't have row bags there's a there's a lot of different things on the market that you can use there's a lot of companies out there um, that are selling a lot of products um, you know uh, the next probably most popular thing after row bags is going to be beads there's uh, different size beads there's different colors and uh, you know there's hard beads and soft beads uh, there's a hundred companies out there that are selling them. Um, if you are looking for soft beats, there's different companies like Lick'em Lures, Trout Candy, Kite Fish, Clear Drift. Um, now, if you're looking for hard beats, you know you can get them from uh, Great Lakes Steelhead, Trout Beats, uh, Mr. Dirks, River Reaper, Slay and Steel, North Shore, uh, Kite Fish. Um, there's a there's a, you know numerous companies out there that have different eggs uh, soft there's Jensen eggs uh, you got you know anything that imitates a fish egg is, is going to be good um, outside of that uh, you know a lot of the things that the fly fishermen are going to throw you know some people drift uh, woolly buggers or you know uh, different nymphs, uh, streamers, um, you know, bunny strips, um, jigs, uh, spoons, um, Colorado blades, uh, I had a, uh, tube jigs, um, yarn flies, don't forget about yarn flies, uh, those look amazing in the water and not a lot of people are fishing those anymore. So, you know, you're going to have to, you know, put a couple of things in your bag, uh, soft worms. Um, there's a bunch of different ways you can rig up soft worms. Yeah, you can wacky rig uh, the worms. Um, you can thread them on your line. There's a, a bunch of ways to do worms. Uh, there's a bunch of ways to do the beads. Uh, you can peg the beads with uh, toothpicks if need be. Uh, I suggest getting the pegs. The pegs are a lot better. Uh, the majority of the beads on the market are going to use the same size peg. Uh, some of the glass beads <coughs> are, uh, uh, the holes in the glass beads sometimes are a little bit bigger. I don't use a lot of glass beads, but those are very popular for a lot of guys as well. Uh, Again, there's the example of a lot of things are uh, personal preference, but um, you know, depending on what bait you're going to use, it might dictate what kind of hook you're going to use. But uh, you know, as a general rule of thumb, if you're fishing a smaller bait with lower flow and clear water, then you're going to want a lighter wire gauge uh, hook. And if you're fishing bigger baits, bigger water, bigger current, or with less visibility, then you might want to step up um, the type of hook to a, a thicker wire, a uh, more substantial hook. Uh, my personal preference for a hook, I like using the, the Raven Specialist hook. Um, the Raven uh, Sickle hooks are good as well. Um, the sickle hooks, the sizing is, is a little bit different, so you'll have to be careful if you're going to order those offline. Just make sure you know. Um, 
the sizing for those. The size 4 and the size 6 of the sickle hooks are gigantic. Um, you know, you typically, for me, I'm fishing usually size 10 or size 12 if I'm using the sickle, but I prefer, uh, for an all-round hook, I kind of use the, the Raven Specialist hook. Uh, it's got an offset eye, and uh, that's because I prefer, personally, uh, to always use a snelled knot. I find the snelled knot is a lot more effective for grabbing the fish, especially if you're out uh, fishing a bead. Um, but it's just a general preference for myself, even when I'm fishing worms or or uh, or uh, spawn sacks, I'm still using a snelled hook, um, a snelled knot on the hook. So I think we've pretty much covered everything outside of species. Um, you know, once you get comfortable with fishing with the center pin, um, you know, the, the sky's the limit. If you're fishing with a, a little bit of current and there's walleye in the in a system and you can pin for walleyes, you can pin for catfish, you can pin for smallmouth bass, um, you know, anything, even if you're dead sticking, you know, there's opportunities to use the center pin. If you're going for a pike in the spring, you can, you know, dead stick a, a smelt and with your center pin and, you know, it just depends on how far you have to cast. Uh, a lot of guys are using their center pins for ice fishing. Uh, just the way the line behaves is a lot like the inline um, ice fishing reels that uh, are out there. So you can ice fish with your center pin. Um, Outside of that, I like to fish for carp a lot with my center pin. You know, a uh, bait, uh, bait runner reel is very popular for fishing for carp because it has uh, like a, a looser setting on the drag so the fish can peel off line without taking your rod into the water. Um, and then you can engage your, your main drag like that and then you have the full drag that's uh, being applied to the fish. You know, the center pin can do that as well uh, with the clicker. You just have to be careful that you don't get a lot of line jumping off your center pin if you're using it for carp. Um, it might tangle around something and then pull your whole your whole rig into the water. Um, but if you are going to fish for carp with your center pin, you, you're going to want to step up and get a beefier rod, maybe a rod that's designed for carp. Um, if you're fighting a carp on a, on a float rod, uh, the fight uh, is going to take a long time. And they're, uh, you know, they're almost as strong as a salmon at times. And, um, you know, if you get a salmon in, a, in the wrong conditions, like, it can take a long time to fight with, a, with like, a noodle rod. So, um, there's a lot of things to play with with the center pin. Um, hopefully, I've given you you know, a set of tools uh, that you can kind of use as a checklist to see if you're prepared to, to step on the water and start center pinning. But, uh, you know, outside of that, there's a lot of resources out there at your disposal. Uh, you can use the Raven Tackle uh, YouTube channel or the Raven Tackle website. Uh, you can message, you can message them through Instagram to have some questions answered. There's chat groups on Facebook. Uh, you can message the Angler Files. Uh, you can subscribe to the Angler Files YouTube channel. Uh, they have a lot of material out for multi-species, and uh, you know, hopefully, I've given you enough to get started with center pinning. And uh, if you have questions down the road, then don't feel uh, any hesitation to contact me uh, or through the Angler Files or you know through Raven Tackle, and uh, I'll do my best to answer your questions. Hope you have fun out there. Um, I just wanted to add this to the video. I, I felt it was important and you can choose whether or not you, you listen to this at all. But, um, you know, from my experience, make sure you know your rules and regulations. Uh, know your seasons. Um, your, you know, your, how many fish you can keep. Um, where you can fish, when you can fish. Um, you know, don't litter, like follow all the rules. Um, it seems every season there's fewer and fewer spots that people can fish and uh, you know it all seems to boil back to people not respecting um, people's private property or 
the rules that are out there and or littering um, you know there's towns and that are you know limiting access to the rivers and to the piers and these are you know there's a reason for it so you know just make sure you're not contributing to that and then outside of that um, there's a lot of pressure you know from you know activists and that so you know just be cognizant of you know how you're handling the fish and the types of uh, photographs that you're taking you know make sure you're handling the fish as, as well as you can um, now, also with social media, just be aware, like, you know, if you're going to be posting pictures with backgrounds and, you know, dates and locations and times and everything else, you know, you're basically doing the work for everybody else. So, um, you know, don't be surprised if that secret spot that you fished or that early run that you found or, you know, if you post all that onto social media, don't be surprised if the next time you get there, you're the third car there. Um, not to say there's anything wrong with posting things to, to social media, just be aware of the impact that they can have and, and you know, everyone's opinions around that. So, um, you know, but at the end of the day, like, hopefully I've given you everything you need uh, to get started out there and, and uh, you enjoy your time on the water. Just a whole bunch of advice today. Um, one last thing I forgot to add is, you know, make sure you have good etiquette. Uh, when you're on the water. Um, if you're fishing beside somebody, you know, make sure you're giving them plenty of room. Um, you know, if they're fishing a different technique than you, you know, they might be tough to fish beside. If, you know, if you're pinning and the guy beside you is fly fishing or using spinning gear, then your, your casts are going to be out of sequence and that. So, you know, give him his space. He, he or she got there first. And, uh, you know, go find yourself uh, a different piece of water, but, uh, you know, just, you know, have, have a little bit of etiquette when you're on the water. Uh, you don't know the type of week that that person beside you is having, and, you know, if, if you're not giving them the space, then, you know, you're going to ruin their day, and they could ruin your day. So, um, you know, just have some etiquette out there, and follow the rules, don't litter, but, uh, at the end of the day, if you do all these things, then, uh, you know, hopefully you'll have a lot more fun out there.